Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about experiment three, entitled quantitative analysis versus qualitative analysis. The cool part about experiment three is that this is actually the first experiment you guys are gonna actually do like a real chemical change. So everything we've done so far has been looking at like physical properties. The first lab, we looked at a lot of measurements. We did boil water, we froze, or made, we didn't freeze water entirely, but we made water colder, that kind of stuff. That's a physical change. The second lab, looking at density, again, was looking at physical properties, measuring physical properties of the substance we're examining. This lab, however, is actually gonna cause some chemical changes to happen. So it's kind of cool because you can actually see those chemical changes. Let's talk a little bit about qualitative versus quantitative though. Qualitative is more, what is it? Is it like, it's more a description of something. It's, what color is this? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what color is this? Does this form bubbles when it reacted? Does this dissolve? It's, it can't be expressed as a numerical value. Quantitative data, though, is data that can be expressed as a numerical value. It's something we can count. It's how many particles do I have? How many things reacted? How many grams went into the reaction of this substance and how many grams of this substance were produced in a reaction? We still have conservation of mass going on, right? We still know that we cannot create nor destroy matter, but substances can be converted from one kind of species to another through chemical reactions. And quantitative is looking at those numbers, how much. So while qualitative is looking at what, quantitative is looking at how much. Qualitative chemistry. So identification of a substance based on physical and or chemical properties. That's like paper chromatography. Um, you guys don't do paper chromatography in this lab anymore, but some of you guys have done this when you were younger as children as an art project. It's really common to do to like make like, I often see students do it with butterflies. They'll take a coffee filter and they'll color the coffee filter and then spray it with water and the colors all blend together. Or they'll take like a piece of like a coffee filter, something with a porous material like a coffee filter, and they'll touch it into a liquid, a colored liquid, and the liquid will travel up that porous material. If you've ever had um, food dye, like if you're dyeing Easter eggs and you take a paper towel and you touch the corner of that paper towel to the food dye, the color will kind of wick its way up the paper towel. It's absorbing up the paper towel. That is paper chromatography. Or not, that's not directly paper chromatography, um, but that's a type of chromatography. It's the sample absorbing up the material. It's called capillary action. You'll learn about that in the beginning of second semester. It's called capillary action, but it's what's causing the color to kind of wick up the paper towel or the filter or whatever porous material you're using. Other examples would be like color or solubility. What color does it change and is it soluble in something? If I put table salt, sodium chloride, into water, it does dissolve. If I put a noodle, if I'm going to make pasta, let's say I put an elbow macaroni noodle into water, it doesn't dissolve. It cooks, it gets softer if I heat up the water, but it doesn't dis disappear. So today you're going to examine physical properties through tests of a variety of ionic solids. Remember we talked about ionic in class. Ionic means a cation and an anion paired up. Most often metal, non-metal, but you could also have two polyatomics. So like ammonium with something else. You're looking for solubility, meaning does it dissolve? You're looking for color change. Is there a color change? Gas formation, which is exhibited by bubbling of the solution. You're gonna check the pH of the solution. Is it acidic, basic, or neutral? And the formation of a precipitate, meaning does a solid form. And that would be a solid separate from what you originally started with, of course. So what you're going to do for the qualitative test is you are, will have an unknown. So make sure that you are writing down your unknown number again. Okay, that is very important. Every lab it's how I'm actually able to fully grade you on these reports. The, I do have a set of a rubric I have to follow for grading of these reports. And your unknown identity is part of that rubric. So please make sure to record your unknown number. Record the color of your substance. Is it white? Is it clear? Is it a solution? Is it a solid? You know, if it's crystals, 
What color are they? Are they all white? Are they blue? Are they green? Are they purple? What color are they? You can get creative. You know, I've seen things like peach. That's cool. I don't care. Whatever color you see. Because the ish, the real reason here is at the end of it, you're going to be identifying an unknown by comparing it to what you saw on the other substances. So the more specific you are with your descriptions, the easier it will be for you to identify what you have. Does your, um, does your solid sample look like crystals or is it powder-like? Does it form a cloudy solution? Does it dissolve? And this is the key you're going to use on your report sheet. P stands for precipitate formed, meaning it got cloudy. G stands for gas formed. There was bubbling. AQ means that a precipitate dissolves. No solid is present. So there's no solid anymore. It dissolved it. And NR means no reaction change. Nothing happened. It looks the exact same as when you started. So you're going to follow the grid that's in your manual and pictured here. Now, we do have um, new well plates, so it will look similar to this, but it will be actually nice little well plates or ceramic plates. Please be careful with them. They're, they're heavy, um, but they're really nice quality well plates, so please be careful with them. You're going to go through here, and you're going to place a few crystals onto the designated circle on the plate. So, for example, here, where it says NaH, Na2HPO4, sodium hydrogen phosphate, you're going to put a little bit, just a, see, there's just a tiny little amount there, just the tip of the spatula there. Sodium carbonate next to it, sodium sulfate, and down the line. You've got sodium chloride, sodium iodide, and then you're going to place a little bit of crystals of your unknown here. Record any observations about the appearances. Record, do they look like crystals? Do they look like powders? Are they clear? Are they white? Are they pink? Whatever you see. And then you're going to add designated solutions per the directions in the lab manual and record all your results. So you've got sodium hydrogen phosphate here, and then it's going to tell you to do something to it. Then it's going to tell you what to put in this circle, this circle, this circle, and this circle. But these in, this entire sequence here is all based on Na2. PO4, HPO4. That does not mean you put solid in every circle. There's times where you're going to do something and then add something else to it, add something to it and see what happens. But this entire sequence here is all based on sodium hydrogen phosphate. All these circles are based on sodium carbonate, sodium sulfate, sodium chloride, sodium iodide, and then your unknown. And you should be able to use the results if you're unknown. Every one of these box, every one of these little circles here correlates back to some specific thing about your unknown, which will correlate to one of the possibilities here. And all of these are possible unknowns. So some of, some of you guys will have one, some will have a different one. Now the quantitative test. Once you determine, so this is, again, this is all determining this unknown, okay? Unknown by qualitative test. And I should also emphasize that the top row here will be solids. After that, you also have corresponding liquids um, or solutions of each, each sample in your uh, kit that you guys pick up. You'll pick up your little kit from the front of the room, little box that has all the stuff. So although you put a solid here and you will have solid unknown here, you will then find the bottle that has a dropper bottle that has like Na2HPO4 aqueous, and that will go into here, and then you'll do tests from there. And that happens for each one. So you do have a solid sample for each one and a liquid sample for each one. Read the manual closely because you're going to put solids in certain spots and liquids in certain spots. The second part of the lab, though, is that qualitative or quantitative test. You're going to determine the form formula of a hydrated salt. Now, there is no reason why you have to go through the first part first and this part second. You, I recommend setting this part of the lab up first and getting it going because it takes time for it to heat. Get this heating, then go ahead and do your qualitative test while you're watching this reaction happen, okay? But what a reminder of what is empirical formula? Well, empirical formula is a smallest whole number ratio of the elements in a compound. So for example, CaCl2, I have one calcium to two chloride ions. NaCl, one sodium to one chloride. ZnSO47H2O, that's, we learned about that in naming, but that's called zinc sulfate heptahydrate. It means that the zinc sulfate has seven water molecules loosely attached to its crystal structure. And for every one zinc, and one sulfate ion, we have seven water molecules. So what is a hydrated salt? 
Well, it's just a crystalline salt molecule with loosely attached water molecules. As I just said, not even thinking about it. Um, the water molecules are incorporated into the crystal structure of the salt. The water molecules, though, can be driven off the sample if we heat it. So that's what we're going to do today is we're going to heat a sample of a hydrated salt, a copper sulfate salt. We're going to heat it on a hot plate and drive off that water. To determine the empirical formula, we're going to figure out, like, this is for zinc, hydrated zinc sulfate. We're going to figure out the formula for hydrated copper sulfate. This is what your copper sulfate looks like when it's a um, hydrated salt. And once we've driven off the, all the water, it's called anhydrous. And this is what the copper sulfate is going to look like as an anhydrous salt. Meaning it just, anhydrous again just means it doesn't have any water left. So you're going to take your hot plate, plug it in. You're going to have your Erlenmeyer flask, and you're going to put some copper sulfate hydrated salt into that Erlenmeyer flask. That's all that's going to be in there. I know it might look like there's a little liquid in here. It's not. It's just going to have some solid down here. All right, I guess let's make that blue since your sample will definitely be blue. You're just going to have some salt down here. Okay? Before you start, you're going to measure your empty crucible. You're then going to add your sample to the crucible. And you're going to measure that again. Measure the mass of that. Read the handout. It tells you, I think it's about two and a half grams you're going to add. But read the handout for sure. So take the mass of the empty um, and just, I apologize. This should say Erlenmeyer. And Erlenmeyer. Everywhere that says crucible should say Erlenmeyer. I do apologize, I do this lab elsewhere and I use a crucible for them. But early Myers work just as, just as well, so I apologize, that's my fault for not catching that. Um, but your Erlenmeyer Meyer with your sample, then that's the difference between these two is how you're gonna find the mass of your actual sample. The Erlenmeyer Meyer plus sample, after 10 minutes of heating, Etc. So what you're going to do basically, um, read your procedure, because again, this is, um, I apologize, it's a little bit messy here, because I did copy this all over from the other class I teach, where I use um, crucibles for it. So please make sure to read your procedure directly, because it does talk about using the Erlenmeyer flask and stuff like that. And it works completely fine, the same way, either way. Um, but you're going to basically put your salt into the Erlenmeyer, heat it, heat it for the time described in your lab manual. You will then take it off, let it cool. You have to let the sample cool completely before you try to heat it. Two reasons, we don't want to destroy your balance, okay? The, these balances are quite expensive, and we want to keep them looking as nice as they do, so we don't want to put hot, really hot things on them. But two, hot glass weighs less than cold glass. Just the natural physics behind it, the way air currents work is when it's really hot like that, it's pulling the air around it up the glass, and it helps it cool it down faster, but also makes it weigh less. So you have to get it back to room temperature before you go ahead and weigh it. Uh, you're going to record the final mass, and the final mass of that Erlenmeyer plus sample is going to be missing the sam water sample. So it's going to be lighter because the water is missing. You will perform two trials of this, so you are welcome to do the two trials in tandem, meaning next to each other. Just use two different Erlenmeyer flasks, but you have to mark them. We do have wax pencils so that you can mark them because you have to make sure you know which one is which. Which Erlenmeyer is your starting sample for one, which Erlenmeyer is the starting sample for the other, but I recommend working these up at the same time. So, on the pre-lab, list observations that indicate a chemical reaction has taken place. Think about chemical changes, not physical changes. Number two, determine which properties are physical or chemical. If sugar dissolves in water, burning of a natural gas. Color. Color is kind of a trick here because color is considered a physical property. Identifying the color of substance is a physical property, but a color change is a chemical property. Density and silver precipitates as a chloride salt. That means silver forms a solid as a chloride salt. So silver ions were in solution. I added chloride ions to that solution and out came silver chloride in solid form. A student heated a 2.005 gram sample of a copper sulfate and hydrous or in um, copper sulfate hydrated salt we see x and y here we don't know what those values are we're trying to determine them to drive off the water from the hydrated salt the anhydrous salt remember hydrous means there's no water left so anhydrous is just copper sulfate 
weighed 1.283 grams. What is the mass of water lost? Well, we know that your original sample weighed 2.005 grams, and then once all the water was driven off, we had 1.283 grams left, so that must be the difference, right? How many moles of water were lost? Well, how do we get from grams to moles? We use your molar mass conversion. How many moles of anhydrous salt remain? We have the mass of the anhydrous salt. We also can use the molar mass there to convert. Watch your sig figs here. And then what is the empirical formula of the, for the hydrate? Again, we talk about this in class, but empirical formula is the smallest whole number ratio of one species to the other. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out my moles here. And my moles here. And one of them is going to be a bigger number. I want a ratio, which means I'm going to take those two numbers and I'm going to divide one by the other to figure out the ratio of them to one another. But I also want the lowest number and I want a whole number. So I'm going to divide the larger amount of moles by the smaller. That's going to give me my ratio. And then we've got a 1.802 gram sample of an unknown compound containing 0.721 grams of carbon, 0.121 grams of hydrogen, and 0.960 grams of oxygen. The compound has a molar mass of 182 um, grams, 180.2 grams per mole. Determine the empirical formula of the compound and the molecular formula. Again, we can do that looking at, um, we have examples like this in our notes, in chapter three notes. I highly recommend you go ahead and look at those and how we can actually do this. But remember what we want to do. We want the moles of each species. There's a few different ways we can do the sample, but let's just walk through one of them. We want the moles of each species. So number of moles of carbon. 0.721 grams of carbon. Convert that to moles. That's going to give me a set number. What is that number? Go ahead and calculate that. That's going to give you moles of carbon. You then have number of moles of hydrogen, 0 0.121 grams of hydrogen. Convert that to moles of hydrogen. Now you've got your moles of hydrogen and we need the moles of oxygen. What is it? 0 0.960 grams of oxygen. It's going to give you the moles of oxygen. Now out of these three numbers, one of them is gonna be the smallest. Which one? I don't know. Well, okay, actually I do know, but you have to calculate it, right? You're then gonna take all three and divide them by the smallest number, by the smallest number of moles. That's going to give you your ratio. It's going to give you the value of X for C, the value of Y for H, and the value of Z for O. Remember to round these to whole numbers. If they are not whole numbers, you round to the nearest whole number. Or if it's like one and a half, you have to multiply through by two. If it's 1.33, you multiply through by three, like we've talked about in class. But that's going to give you the empirical formula, okay? That's the lowest whole number ratio. Go ahead and figure out the molar mass of this compound. So like, let's say it was one to one to one. It is not one to one to one, by the way. So you have to actually do the math here. It is not a one to one to one ratio. But if it was, I would say 12.01 grams of carbon, 1.008 grams of hydrogen, and 16 grams of oxygen to get the molar mass of the compound. So 16, 28, about 29 grams for CHO. I would then take that 180.2 grams per mole, divide it by 29 grams per mole, and I would get some ratio. And I know that it's not, uh, this is not gonna give me the right answer because it's not the right ratio in the first place, but Let's see if it gets me anything. No, it gets me near six. Yeah, that's what I figured it would do. It gets me near six. Then I would say, okay, well, this is the ratio. Or this is the scaling up of it. So I would say C6 
H6O6 for my ratio or for my overall compound. Because this is what this is showing me is that my empirical formula, my lowest whole number ratio is the ratio of those species to each other. This is the molar mass of that. The molar mass of the actual compound is six times greater than that. I have to keep the ratio of the elements the same, but the overall molar mass of the true compound is six times greater. Therefore, I must have six times the amount of elements I'm saying I do in my empirical formula. Again, this is not the correct answer here. Okay, so you do have to actually calculate it to figure out the correct answer. So how are you going to do this? Um, this is what your report sheet will look like. <coughs> Excuse me. I apologize. Um, this is where you're going to write like the P, G, N, R, all that kind of stuff and identify your unknown. Please remember to write down your formula and name down here. So like if you identify it as sodium uh, chloride, you're going to write NaCl and you're going to write sodium chloride here. You must have both of those lines filled in because we are practicing naming here. And if you get confused, come see me. I'll help you. I don't mind. But we need to have that completely filled in for full credit. Your table should be completely filled in too. Here's what your report sheet looks like for determining the empirical formula of the um, copper sulfate. So again, what is the appearance before the hydrate before heating? There is a question on your manual or in your report sheet that asks you this. And you should see something that looks like this. It's a really pretty blue color when it starts. I'm going to take the mass of the empty flask, the mass of the flask plus the salt hydrate, the mass of the flask plus your anhydrous salt. Remember this is after heating, so anhydrous means no water left behind. You can take the mass of the flask plus anhydrous salt. So let's just label these. A B and C and D. So to get the mass of the hydrous salt, you're going to take letter C and subtract letter B, right? Or I just wrote that backwards. I apologize. You're going to take letter B and... Hold on a second. I apologize. I'm reading too many things at once. Okay. Mass of the anhydrous salt. Let me actually write that in the right spot. So D is going to be equal to C minus A because I want to subtract your entire flask. Mass of water loss, let's call that E. E is equal to your hydrated salt plus flask, which is B, minus the flask and hydrous salt, which is C. Moles of water that were in the hydrate prior to heating, well, that's letter E, convert to moles. Moles of anhydrous copper sulfate is letter D, convert to moles. And the empirical formula is that dividing by the lowest number of moles. Here again is an example of how to work through this with some numbers from some, um, a very similar experiment done with students. So in this lab, they determined the empirical formula of a hydrated magnesium salt um, specifically Epsom salt. And yes, I can look up online what the formula of Epsom salt is, but we want to show you guys how to do this experimentally, right? So the Epsom salt by itself, normally Epsom salt, if you buy it, looks like this. When it's been dried, it looks like this. Very clear differences. Students measured the mass of a hydrated salt and the mass of the hydrous salt. They then found the mass of the water that was lost from subtracting those two numbers the moles of the water lost from converting this number here to moles with the mass of anhydrous salt they were able to find the moles of anhydrous salt by converting this number here to moles they then had at this point once they found the moles of everything they had the moles of the anhydrous salt and the moles of water they compare those two numbers and they see that 0 0.0113 is smaller than 0 0.0792. So they're gonna subtract, or sorry, divide both numbers by the smaller of the two numbers. That's giving me that ratio. And I see the ratio I come up with is a one to seven. That means that I have one magnesium to seven waters, and that is the empirical formula for the compound. And then what is the percent um, by mass water in the salt? Sometimes it's asked, sometimes it's not. If they wanted to know how much water was in the sample, they ha knew that they had um, 1.427 grams of water lost. The original sample, um, I 
apologize, that's actually the wrong number written down there. The original sample was 2.788 grams. And I will fix that, I apologize. And so therefore, 52% of the original sample was actually comprised of water. Then you report sheet and post lab. So what is the appearance of the solid after heating? So after you fill in your table here, you're going to say, what does it appear after heating? And you should see something that looks, I apologize for scrolling so much, but I have pictures on a lot of different slides. You should see something that looks like this. It's like a light blue tint to the color, but it looks pretty white too. You should see a light blue tint to it still. A little bit, not much. The copper gives you a little bit of blue color. What is the name of the original hydrate in the anhydrous product after heating? Well, once you know what those values of X and Y are, you can name the original hydrate you should be able to name the anhydrous without even doing the lab. And then your post-lab question, a student has a compound that may be a hydrate of cobalt 2 chloride. Describe an experiment the student could perform to determine if the solid was indeed the hydrate rather than the anhydrous salt. And since you just completed an experiment like this, this should be pretty easy to do. Good luck.